Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Pearl Lamb podcast, in which Pearl will be talking to some of the world's brightest talents and emerging voices to inspire you and who knows, perhaps even to disrupt your way of thinking. I'm Rebecca Jones. I was the BBC's arts correspondent for more than 20 years. And in this, the first episode, I'm going to be chatting to Pearl about some of the subjects that she wants to explore and also her own remarkable story. So, Pearl Lamb, welcome (laughs) to your own podcast. I want to start by asking you a bit more about you, finding out a bit more about you. Who is Pearl Lamb? I'm... It's very hard to even describe myself because, you know, we are always ever changing and we have so many layers. So I think, you know, in the general perception from uh, from people is that um, I'm a gallerist, I'm a, um, I'm a successful gallerist, I promote a Chinese contemporary art and um, I'm a very strong promoter about it. And actually, I mean, within within the art scene, they knew that I'm the first one who launched the Chinese abstract. When uh, when we were told, I remember one of the curators, one of the very senior curators, the curator who who first introduced the Chinese contemporary art to America, uh, Gao Ming Lu, Professor Gao Ming Lu, called me up and said, when I there was like. Uh, in um, early 2000, she said to me, whenever I mention about abstract, Chinese abstract, all the Western academics, all the Western curators is telling me that we are copying, um, falling the West, we are copying the West. He said, I'm too tired. I couldn't fight, fight. I couldn't fight anymore. Why don't you take up the job? And why don't you go and tell them that we are very different? And, and all our, I mean, our Chinese abstract is actually rooted from Chinese calligraphy, based on our Chinese culture, Confucianism, Buddhism, and, and Taoism. So, so he created a show for me in the gallery called Maximalism. And then I launched, when I, I opened the Hong Kong Gallery in 2012, I, I believe, or 2011, I couldn't, couldn't remember. And we opened, instead of a solo artist show, we opened a Chinese abstract show. And from then on, every gallery was doing Chinese abstract. Yeah. So we were known about that. And um, So you were a disruptor? Of course I'm a disruptor. But I disrupt things because I think that um, I need to, because I believe in certain conviction, I think that um, and there is too much of the world pushing for Western domination. Before we have a colonialism of, uh, of the country, and now we have a colonialism of a culture. And I know that you were from a wealthy family, and I wanted to ask you, were there parental expectations about the kind of career that you of would course. pursue? My parents like every Chinese, except today, except my generation. Um, my, my parents' gen, uh, generation, of course, they want, to, they want you to either participate in family business or to be a professionals, lawyer, doctors, accountants, et cetera, et cetera. So... Um, what did they want for you? I studied accountancy and financial management because I was stopped from pursuing art or architecture. And by at then. the time, by then, because my father at the time, the family has not become a property developer yet. So, and so our family business at the time was garment manufacturing and selling uh, quarters and textile manufacturing. So then eventually, and, and eventually they become property developers. So one of the thing that I was told, you can't study architecture. Seven years, you're trying running away. And then he said, you know, being an architect, you have to grovel. You have to grovel to develop. I couldn't see you groveling to anybody, <laughs> that's my father. And then he said, ah, no way. It's a sh- what am I going to explain to my, to my friends? So anyway, so when I went back to Hong Kong before, uh, to negotiate my return because he said, if I don't return to Hong Kong, he's going to cut off all my expenses. Because you'd gone to China to try out a career no, as a property what developer? I, what, what I did is when I saw my father in 1992 to negotiate my return, um, I, I wanted to open a gallery. 
Not that I know how a gallery operate. In my mind is, I want to open something, I want to do something that he has no control over. So I thought doing art would be fantastic because there's no control. So I went back and I wore my torn tight black lipsticks <laughs> and really, really very punky. And I went and saw him, he was shocked, completely shocked. He said, what is this? Where's my daughter? <laughs> and, and so I said, so he said, what are you going to do? He said, uh, profession, come back to the, to, to the family, going to be accountant, going to be a lawyer. I said, no, I'm going to open a gallery. He said, give me, give me your credit cards. So okay. all his support started cutting off. He said, you, he said, you cannot be, I didn't send you away for over 10 years to return to become a shopkeeper. I said, you don't even un and understand what a gallery means. Anyway, so to cut it short, following day, he called me up. He said, I'm giving you a golden opportunity of your life. And I said, what? He said, you go to Shanghai and you learn to be a property developer. And he said, there's a piece of land, your mother is doing it, you go there. I said, I couldn't even speak Mandarin, my Chinese, until 11 years old. How could I go? He said, you can learn. He said, today, how you look, no one even would um, employ you as a receptionist. All right. Okay. <laughs> he said, okay. <laughs> so, so I got a very, I negotiated a very good deal. Fantastic deal. Very high salary. And also I have, I have, um, I have, how would I say, uh, and also I've been paid full expenses for my traveling expenses. So it's only three weeks Shanghai, two weeks Hong Kong, two weeks London. That, that was my deal. Yeah. You, you, you forged your own path ultimately against perhaps your family's wishes, mm -hmm. but where did this, this love, this passion for contemporary art come from? From young, I learned painting. And also because I have ADHD, so the, they didn't realize it was ADHD. So I was learn how to focus. So I have to, were taught to do Chinese calligraphy, small ones since I was four years old. And then it gradually, I start doing Chinese paintings. So already I know that I can paint. And one of my A-levels, I didn't even do go to any studio works, but I passed my, my, my studio because I paint. I use, I transfer Chinese painting into watercolor. So I have that love for it. I have that passion. Did you want to be an artist at any point? Um, it wasn't, I mean, when I wanted to become an artist, it was just an escape from the control from my father. I didn't know what I wanted. And, and I want to be, but I'm very creative as well. I'm, I'm very good in designing as well. So I know that I have that, but I didn't know what to do with it, right? So then uh, when I have my extra pocket money in, uh, in my university days, sometimes I will go to graduate show and sometimes I will, I will buy things, I will collect things, buy things. Then when it comes to uh, redecorating of my flat, um, in um, at the time, because all Chinese parents, if, I mean, when they send children abroad, they would try to buy them something, buy them an apartment. So, so when I start decorating, so I start meeting the designers. So then I feel that wow, especially at the time in eighty nine, nineteen ninety one, when the, when when the economy was really bad. So I thought, wow, why don't I have the opportunity to bring them to show them in? Hong Kong. So that was in my mind. And then I knew, and then when I went back to Hong Kong, the only thing I know is I need to find something that I would be out of the control from my family. So, so I thought art was really the thing I wanted to do. And then um, based on the negotiation with my father, I could do pop-up shows. But he didn't understand what pop-up shows means. So the first pop-up shows I did I felt that I was alive. I felt that all my life I've been a living zombie. And then when I was doing the show, preparing the show, I thought I was alive. And then I realized that this is what I want. 
And you set up your first physical gallery, I physical think I'm gallery right, in, in Shanghai 2005. in 2005. Right, yeah. And you wanted from the outset, didn't you, to showcase a diverse completely range of artists range, from completely different not, backgrounds. Yeah, not the one that was always in the Western world. And so how unusual was that back in 2005? Oh, there's no one have seen it. It was really, really di- very, very different. I was showing... I was showing artists that I think the Chinese art will recognize, but the outside of that that world, they don't. They don't know. And it was really exciting. And then um, I remember at that time, um, I wasn't even focused in and in selling. I remember at that time, I have Asian Society Museum at the time, director Melissa Chiu, who's now in her shop, who came in and said to me, is, um, is why don't you change as a foundation? At least we can work with you. And it's a choice because I'm not seriously selling. I was just showing the work, but I don't want to change into foundation because there's too much restriction. So I have to tick in, I have to be serious. And that was 2007, six and seven. I have to, I have to be serious to know which direction I'm going. In terms of contemporary art, mm. you've also broadened the possibilities, haven't you? I mean, you deal with digital art, for example, yes. don't you? You've sold Mr. Doodle. Why is it important, do you think, that contemporary art continues to push the boundaries? Because some people find it quite difficult to relate to. We talk about contemporary art, so it's contemporary culture. So how can we rebel against a contemporary culture? We have to be in sync of what and what the world is moving to. I mean, I mean, I, when I first start with these NFT, what do I know about NFT? So I have to employ younger people and um, a complete different way of an uh, approaching. I mean, it's not that I really want to, to make money out of NFT, but at least you have to be understanding the NFT. You know, as a contemporary art gallery, or, or, and, and, and when you want to, to cultivate younger gen- uh, generation, we have to speak the, the same language. If we can't, we are going to lose them. And we want, we want, them, we want to improve, we want to cultivate them so that they would appreciate how these older generation of artists are as well. Yeah. But with artists able to deal directly with the public through social media, does that place sort of physical galleries like yours in jeopardy? Do I we mean, need them? No, depending on what sort of artists we are talking about. I mean, there's there's still many artists who is not so, I mean, so familiar with the, the social media. The younger one, the popular artist like Mr. Dudo, of course, he has nearly three million followers. But we work very well together. And... He was really the first artist that I have who is so popular. I mean, it's a completely new experience for, for us because we don't, I mean, we have all these brand labels asking for collaboration. Never had it. So for us, it's learning process as well. Well, in terms of that learning process, how do you see the future of Pearl Lamb Galleries? I think we are moving. I mean, sometimes I have to question, what is a gallery? What is a gallery function is going to be? I mean, with... I think with the technology growing, so we always have to find our own place. What what we you know what exactly a gallery can offer an artist or offering the art world. So I think as time changes, as technology changes, we will always find our new way. I mean, new way of how to support artists. Are we going to are we going to be completely becoming a dealer, just doing a commercial thing, or are we going to support an artist? the way that we support the artists of getting them into museum and you know museum and and institution i think museum is also has to change as well because so far all the all the top names museum seem they're rejecting all these popular artists because academically they you know they are not the same as the academic artists but the younger generation are rejecting all these academic because they don't want to read. They don't want to read so much. And so are we going to stop all these contemporary artists, all these popular artists, 
stopping them from going to the, the, the top museums? How are the museums people are looking at it? So all these are going to change and we are going to be forced to change, whether we like it or not. Well, I know as well as your galleries, you launched a charity, the China Art Foundation, which you had to close, I know, during the pandemic. But just tell me a little bit about what you saw its purpose and, um, and would you like to reopen I it? Will, I will tell you why I open it. Yeah. Uh, for many, many years... I could not understand Chinese contemporary art, especially the history and the evolution. I always thought that there was a missing link because when you read in, I mean, some uh, uh, some curators in and in the West writing, especially, you know, um, uh, catalogs and, and all that. And when you talk to the artists, it's completely two different stories. And I never could understand why there was a missing link. One day I was given to read an online essay in simplified Chinese. So normally people take less than an hour to finish. It took me seven days because my Chinese level is very low. And after I read it, all the dots connected. And I said, okay, I have to meet this professor. I have to meet, this was Professor Gaming Lu who curated the first a contemporary art show show in China in a national in a national muse and in a national gallery in Beijing uh, in 1989 and after that he was house arrested uh, because of the Tiananmen the, and then later on um, he got the Harvard during the time he got Harvard uh, scholarship for the PhD so he went to Harvard and and then in 1998, he curated a show called Inside Out for the Asia Society Museum in PS1. And later on, it went to the SF MOVA. And that was the first time he introduced Chinese contemporary art to America. So it was him. So I said, I want to meet him. I want to meet him. He said, sorry, he's in Pittsburgh. So I said, can you get an appointment for him? So I flew to Pittsburgh. I flew to Pittsburgh. I went to, saw him. I went to see him, I sat down with him. And then he said, I don't know why you want to see me. I don't curate for and for galleries. I said, I don't have a gallery. I just do pop-up shows at the time. We were talking about 2004, 2005. So I said, I just want to ask you questions. And can you answer me? So we spoke for two, two hours, three hours. Within that, keep on saying that. I'm not curating, so I'm not doing it. I said, don't worry. I'm not asking you. I just want to have answers answers because i need someone to sort me out because there's so many things i couldn't understand so after that i went to london and i called philip's daughter and i said you know what now i've no order missing link what if i have such huge misunderstanding um what should i do to make people understand really what the chinese contemporary our chinese culture is about so he said set up a foundation. So was the one of the ideas behind the foundation to act as a bridge between as East bridge, and West? Yes, as the bridge between the East and West. So the West have a clearer understanding of Chinese culture. Now, the Chinese art does not necessarily just mean contemporary art, because Chinese art, in my terms, is, it cannot be like the West. It's not about modernism. It is about evolving from the Chinese traditions and Chinese philosophy and how they react act with the Western ideas to create this new dynamic uh, official language. Yes. I suppose we live, you don't need me to tell you, in, in a time of heightened geopolitical tension. Can art, especially contemporary art, can it really break down barriers? I can see, it bring people together? I really see that art is soft power. I really see that, that if you look at the contemporary art, if you understand, if you spend some time to understand a piece of artwork and the artist's intention and the artist's biography, it makes you understand Chinese culture better and it will soften that intimidation because the West felt intimidated by China and China is completely misread about the West. So it's, I mean, there has to be some soft power Yes. That comes in and make people more relaxed about it. And do you think the the work of the foundation did that? Were you do I you mean, feel you achieved what you set yes, out to do? Yes, we did. But we did 
we do try and make people understand. And it's great because the Western curators, the curators from the West, the, di the museum directors from the West, they're open-minded. So that's the first step. If you are, if you are open-minded to at least listen, that's the first step. Hmm. Is it your view then that the history of art, especially in Asia, has been massively overlooked? Absolutely. And why Absolutely. do you think that is? No, not enough books, not enough writings, not enough writings in English to communicate and not enough communication. And also in the West is they have this arrogant um, attitude that goes into China initially. They will tell us what is good and what is bad without understanding who we are and what we are and without understanding thing, our history, our traditions. I remember I've talked to different curators. They said, why? This is the contemporary art. When we look at it, it should communicate with you. And I say, yeah, look at the contemporary art today. We have to read a, we read an essay before we can look at the art. It's, it's, I mean, I think you really need to really learn about it, to learn about our root and house before you can look at art. It's too simple. You have achieved so much. What are you most proud of? I'm, I think there's still a long way to go. I'm very proud in one thing is I make friends with all different uh, nationalities, with different culture. And I am very happy that they can share their different culture with me because something is more, it's like when I go to Lagos, people are so friendly, they open doors. And I built so many friendships. That friendship and is, you're going to Nigeria because you want to put I want the to spotlight learn about on the, African artists. Yeah, I want to learn about African art and I only have that two weeks I was free so I took five days to go there and during my university days I do know a lot of Nigerians but I, I but a lot of them are lost I lost contact so then I picked it up I'm um, not a lot but I meet new people and it's great yeah. because it taught me completely a different way of and, and of looking at things. And what is great is, is going through this is already my attitude since I was young is no judgment. And that really strengthened my no judgment policy. Yeah. I'm interested. You talk about the young. There may be people listening to this or watching this who think, I want to be like Pearl Lamb. How do I set up a gallery? How do I do some of the things that you've done? What's your advice? Visit galleries, make friends, start having thing and art and and make an art an art community, and then if you want to do a gallery, do it. Yeah. What happens though if you don't have connections and you don't perhaps come from a privileged background? Where work, are the opportunities? Work in a gallery. Work in a work hard and meet artists, build relationship. I mean, art world like any other business world is all about relationship. You've touched on some of the obstacles that you've had to overcome, but I wonder, did you have a mentor? Did you have anybody who gave you good advice when you were no, starting out? No, at that out? time, no. You know, in Hong Kong, there's nothing. There's nothing. There was one very good gallery. Uh, Han Art Gallery was the, Johnson Chen was the first to sell Chinese contemporary since the 80s. But no, I didn't ask for and for it. I was... I want to find my own way. Maybe that was too arrogant as well. So I would always ask any young people, find someone, talk to them if they have experience. You don't need to make mistakes that, that I've made. I make tons of mistakes because I refuse to ask anyone. I just want to find my own way. So we talked, uh, Pearl, about you being a disruptor. A disruptor is another label. You've also been called a rebel with a cause. What about feminist? Would you I, describe yourself as a feminist? No, no, I don't even think about feminism. Um, I'm brought up in, in Hong Kong. We don't have feminism. We always feel that men and women are all equal. Sometimes women is even, even having a better opportunities than men. So I don't have this urge to strike as a feminist at all. So it's... Nonetheless, many people might think that you have made your way in a man's world. And I wonder how you've done that. I never I never thought that there was male or female. And 
actually whatever I do is by default. I don't think about no. I don't even think that a woman has is in a very disadvantaged position in uh, Hong Kong or in and in, in, in Shanghai is even more strange because in Shanghai is a woman's world. If a woman and a man they go out and work, when a when the woman return when they return back to home, it is the man who cooks, look after the children, and and the man is to be is to worship the woman. And it is always the woman who leads in Shanghai. And it's the only city in the whole of uh, China. And my mother is from Shanghai. So, and in Hong Kong, we never have this problem. Interesting. You it have is very interesting. I mean, it is interesting because yes. certainly from a Western perspective, I would say that is not the case. No, because the rest of China is very different. Shanghai is very different. Hong Kong is very different. I never felt. I even asked my uh, staff, my younger staff in my gallery. No one felt there is a need, or they're being discriminated because they're they are they are women or they are girls or females. But have you never felt actually? I could be a really good role model for other women, especially younger women. No, I never thought about it. The only thing I always, always thought about to men and women, to boys and girls, is I try to encourage to and tell their parents that can you let them to be themselves? To, because to be ourselves is even more difficult than anything because all our parents, they have certain expectations. And then, you know, in the West, we always ask for role models, but can't we be ourselves? Be ourselves to understand ourselves, to be ourselves is 10 times tougher than anything. From the outside, you're living this extraordinary life. You're in Nigeria one week, you're here in London, then you're off to New York. There will be people watching and listening to this thinking, your life is so glamorous, so fantastic. I mean, are you living your best life? I mean, I like my life, but it doesn't mean that um, it is for everyone. I, I mean, I just met last night um, uh, my old staff, and who is uh, who is complaining that she's been traveling in and out, and never stay, never stay in London for more than seven days. So she hated it. So it's just that I can sleep. I don't have jet lag. I love long haul flight. And I love meeting different people. For me, the visuals is like vitamins. So I can see different visuals and talk to, to different people. Knowledge for me is very exciting. Meeting people, talking to and to others is very exciting. It's excruciating exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose I wondered how important it is for you to express yourself through the way you dress and your image. Um, the way I dress is very funny because um, I'm from Hong Kong. I have a Shanghai mother. My Shanghai mother is very important, is dressing, fashion. So from young, I'm trained like this. And my father is a foodie from Chujiao. So I have both. I need food. I'm a really, I'm a foodie and I love fashion. So it's a way of my life. So it's nothing that, you know, all of a sudden I have it. It's from young. I'm doing these, these. So I, I package. I don't. I don't even know it's an image. This is how I am. This is what I am. And I love clothes. I love fashion, and I love to discover different designers. It's so interesting talking to you because, on the one hand, you've totally rebelled against your family and their expectations, and yet on the other hand, you are so shaped by the way you've shaped. been brought up. Frivolity is my middle name. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yes, absolutely, 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 absolutely. Because, you know, you see your mother, you at one, it's true, I rebel against when they control. But there are things that I follow. Yeah. I know you said your father passed away in 2005, but were he here, do you think he would be proud of what you've achieved? I think now, yes. And especially because the art world has, I mean, art world has become so important in every, in every sense. And you will recognize that importance. And then he will realize that I'm in it. So it was a completely a different view in 2000, you know, in the early 2000s and before. Yeah. And, and I suppose my final question to you is, um, 
I can see by talking to you, you're very forward thinking. But if I was to ask you to reflect on what you've achieved, do you think you've shifted the dial on the way that Chinese art in particular is viewed, contemporary art? Do you think you've made a difference? I don't know whether I make a difference, but I definitely has made people be more aware of um, and make people more aware of what is really Chinese contemporary art. Because now I've been talking to, to different people, they all recognize that, that the propaganda, political pop is not the Chinese definition of Chinese contemporary art. That has evolved. So I think, uh, I also believe that uh, uh, people has looked into Chinese art in a very different ways. But as I said, you know, as I told many people, art is art. We are not about passport. It's about people willing to, to go deeper inside to understand the culture. Then you appreciate the art much more.